Hey, welcome to APC Brampton TV. I'm Moses Khan, the discipleship pastor here. I'm so glad you're able to tune in. I hope that you are incredibly blessed as you do so. Listen, if you are in the area, check us out at allpeopleschurch.ca to get location details. And if you want to give and support our ministry, you can do so online as well. Well, I hope you're ready and excited to get into the Word of God. Let's do this. Praise God. Praise God. How many are excited for the Word of God this morning? Good stuff, good stuff. And so we are in a brand new series that Pastor Tony kicked off last week. The series is called Spiritual Rhythms. And so Pastor Tony last week kicked it off talking about the importance that every life, really, there's a rhythm in which you are to live and we are to operate in that rhythm by the grace of of God. Amen? And so today, really my assignment is to share a little bit on the spiritual rhythms of Jesus. What did he include in his personal life that kept him on rhythm, that kept him in the grace of God? I'm really going to go through this passage. It's found in Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 28 to verse 30. We're going to dissect this passage so you get a better understanding of it. And then we're going to look to some of the means, some of the habits of grace from Jesus' life and how we can apply them to our life. I want to read it in the message paraphrase first, and then I'll read it in the ESV, and then we'll get digging. Are you tired, worn out, burdened on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Somebody say rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The ESV translation records Jesus to say this, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Say, learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy And my burden is light. Let's stand as we pray. Father, we thank you that this day we stand in your presence. And as we go through your word, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would apply it to the hearts and the lives of the people here. God, I thank you that your word is everlasting and your word will never fail. So God, as I speak, I pray every bit of self-reliance would fall off and that I would trust in the power of your word. Father, align our hearts, align our lives according to the grace which you have given us. God, glorify yourself in this place today. And I pray in the hearts and in the lives of everyone here, God, that Christ would be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, make some noise for God. Give God some glory. He is worthy 
to be praised. Amen? Amen. I didn't ask you to stop, but that's all right. Come on. Praise God. Praise God. And so let's get started. Let's start digging. Let's start digging. Someone said, you know, when it comes to gardening, raking is easy, right? It makes things look a little good, but sometimes you got to dig. Sometimes you got to dig. And the beauty of digging, my friends, is that you end up finding diamonds. So let's dig in the word of God this morning. How many are excited Amen. Okay, so this passage, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Jesus is extending an invitation to come to him. And he is extending an invitation to all who labor and are heavy laden. All. Anyone and everyone who may be stressed, worried, anxious, grieved, unsettled in any way, or even discouraged. In other words, the invitation that Jesus is extending here applies to you and I if we are in need of rest. Whether that rest is mental, spiritual, emotional, or, or physical. He is extending this invitation to rest. So ask your neighbor if they could use some rest. Sounds like you could use some rest. (laughs) This morning, I believe many of us are in need of rest. But a few things we have to understand here is this. There is an invitation before us. Not only that, but this invitation comes with a blessing. A blessing that is a promise. He says, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Notice the lack of uncertainty in what Jesus is saying. He will give you rest. There's no uncertainty there. But what you need to define for yourself, church, what you need to ask yourself is this. Who is giving this invitation. Who is giving this invitation? Because that will help you determine whether or not this invitation has any weight to it. It will help you determine whether or not the rest that is promised is certain. It will help you determine how much trust you should put in these words. And by faith, accept his invitation to come to him. And the rest of these verses, really the application of this text, all depends on who you define Jesus to be and who he is to you. Because church, if Jesus is just a man, if Jesus is just a historical figure, or even if Jesus is just another prophet, then he is not worth it to put my whole heartedly trust in him. And so who is Jesus? I want to read something Pastor David Platt shared once, and it came to my memory as I was preparing this message. He says this. You see Jesus saying to four fishermen, follow me. We need to feel the weight and the wonder of the one who is speaking here. This is Jesus. The Savior and Messiah, the one promised to come in the kingly line of David and Abraham, father of God's people in Israel, fully human and fully divine, the one who wise men of all nations bow before, the one whose birth ushers in the consummation of generations and generations of prophecy and expectation. He is the Savior King, the righteous judge of the world, perfectly filled with God the Spirit, perfectly loved by God the Father, the only man who's ever conquered sin, the true son that Israel could never be, the light of the world, the hope of all nations. Do we realize who this is? (laughs) 
For when we do, we come to one conclusion. This Jesus is clearly, absolutely worthy of more than nominal adherence and church association. Church, we must not reduce Jesus to a poor, puny Savior who is begging for people to accept him in their hearts. As if Jesus needed to be accepted by us, he doesn't need your acceptance. He doesn't need my acceptance. He doesn't need any acceptance. He's infinitely worthy of all glory in all the universe, and he doesn't need us at all. In fact, we need him, and we need him desperately. Jesus is worthy of total abandonment and supreme adoration. And I end quote. And then the Bible tells us that everything was created for him and through him, everything was created. Not only that, in him are all things held together. This is Jesus. So feel the weight and wonder of the invitation and the promise he's extending to us. Let's go to verse 29. Verse 28 was the what. Verse 29 is the how. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn. From me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now, what is his yoke, church? If you do some research, you'll find out that his yoke, a yoke, is this yellow thing you find when you crack an egg open. But if you do some more research, you'll find out that the yoke Jesus was referring to was a yoke they used for oxen as they plowed fields. And there were these heavy wooden crossbars used to connect two oxen together for more efficient plowing. Now, if there was a young ox, they would pair the young ox with an older ox. And the younger ox would then have to submit to the ways of the older and much wiser ox. So catch this. When Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you, he says, give your allegiance to my ways. Give your allegiance to my path. Just as the young ox has to submit to the older one, submit to me. Let me direct you. I know where I am taking you. And if you would only trust me to take you there, you would see that I have an abundance of grace for you along the way. And you can begin to live according to the rhythm I've created for your life. Then he says, learn from me. And this is where we're going to spend most of our energy and most of our time, but I'm going to come back to it. So let's continue. He says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. So what does this mean? I have an older brother. And growing up, he would teach me things like how to ride my bike, how to hammer a nail, all this other stuff. But then he would also help me with my homework. Now, one of the problems was, was that if I didn't understand something or if I did something wrong, he would get very frustrated. He would lose his cool. He would lose his patience. And so when Jesus says he's gentle and lowly in heart, it means that if if we are willing to be obedient and take his yoke upon us and learn from him, we will find that he is willing to work with us. And that he will be patient toward us. Church, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Your weaknesses don't come as a surprise to him. He is gentle toward us. And so don't let your weaknesses take you away from God but allow them to drive you to him. To rely on his yoke and not go on your own path. You are not your own savior. 
It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when I talk to people over and over and over again. And the thing that keeps them from God is that they keep falling. It's that they're, they're weak and they keep messing up. And this just keeps them from going to God. And I say, hey, don't you understand? That's the very reason you need to go to him. Because you're weak. Whose strength are you trying to rely on? Church, it's very important for us to understand this because if we don't, we will not walk in accordance to the grace of God. And we will walk in accordance to our own desires and rely on our own strengths. He then says, you will find rest for your souls again. There's that promise that comes after the condition of coming to him and taking his yoke Upon us. So, we've gotten through the passage. We've developed some understanding of it. So now let's continue and learn from Jesus. Let's learn from Jesus. There are three things, there are three means of grace. Three means of grace that Jesus teaches us from his personal life. He says, learn from me. And those three means of grace are his voice, his ear, and his body. His voice, his ear, and his body. So what is his voice? His voice is is his word. His voice is his word. This is the word of God. This is the voice of God. In Matthew 4, Jesus gets baptized. The Spirit descends on him like a dove, and then the Spirit drives him into the wilderness to pray, to fast for 40 days and for 40 nights. This is how Jesus starts his ministry. And then Jesus is tempted by the devil, and he uses the word of God to defeat the devil. Okay, in other words, he used the voice of God to defeat the voice of the enemy. Church, whose voice are you listening to? Whose voice are you listening to? See, the battleground is between our ears. And our victory depends on the voice we listen to, the voice we submit to. Notice that the devil tried to defeat Jesus using Scripture. But that wasn't the voice of God. And so here's the question, church. Do you recognize his voice? Are you familiar with his words? One of the things they used to teach us in math class when we would study finances is that people, as they would get trained to handle money and to recognize what money is counterfeit and what bills are fake, what they would do is not study the fake bills, but they would study the real ones. For hours... They would get familiar with the real thing so that if anyone gives them something and it looks even slightly different, they dismiss it. So church, are you that familiar with the voice of God? If you were hearing the voice of the enemy in your mind and you were hearing the voice of God in your mind, would you be able to tell the difference? Would you be able to submit to God's voice over the enemy's voice, even though the enemy's voice might sound a little more tempting? Jesus was starving, and he offered him food, and Jesus didn't take it. Because man shall not live by bread alone. So church, what are you living by this morning? 
Jesus knew the scriptures inside and out. In fact, he quoted the Old Testament 78 times. He knew the scriptures. How much of the Bible do we know? How much of God's voice are we familiar with? And one of the things that bothers me so much is when you ask people, hey man, how's your Bible reading going? They'll say something like, well, I didn't have enough time today. And I just want to whack that person with the Bible. Well, here's some time. Pow. It's not about you having time. It's about you making time. It's not a priority. Church, listen to this stat. It takes about 70 hours to read the Bible from cover to cover. 70 hours. And the stat says this, that's less time than the average North American spends in front of a television every month. Like, let that sink in. Whose voice are we listening to? The second means of grace is his ear. Church, one of the most wonderful things about Christianity is that we have access to the ear of God. Some of you don't know that because y'all aren't, you guys aren't excited. You guys aren't excited, so you don't know that. But you have access to the ear of God. When I was a, when I was a child, I was very shy. And I was an introvert. I'm still somewhat of an introvert. But what I would do is I wouldn't, you know, if I wanted something, if I needed something, I wouldn't speak out loud. And I would go next to my mom and I'd pull her pant leg. Or I'd tug her finger. And then every time I did that, she would stoop down and give me her ear. And I would tell her whatever I wanted. And then she would listen. And so if we were at somebody's house, you know, just tug on our pant leg. Mom, I really want those cookies. But church, do we understand this? That sometimes all we have to do is tug. Sometimes all we have to do is call. Sometimes all we have to do is say, God, are you there? And he will give us his ear. He is willing to listen to you whenever and wherever. Are you willing to speak to him? We have his ear. What a blessing. What a blessing that he actually listens to us. He's not like that annoyed spouse who can't take our voice anymore. I'm not married, so I'm just judging you guys. (laughs) but he is attentive he cares you can exhaust him you can't exhaust him with your words he will listen we have his ear Mark chapter 1 verse 35 Jesus says this or the Bible records this of Jesus says and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark he departed and went out to a desolate place And there he prayed. Jesus is a busy guy. He knows as soon as daylight comes and he steps outside, people are going to gather around him. In other words, he might not have time. So what does he do, church? He wakes up when everyone else is sleeping. While it's still dark outside, just so he could get his time with the Father, just so he could hear his Father's voice, and just so his Father could attend his ear to him. Luke 6, 12, in in these days he went out to the mountain to pray all night. And he continued in prayer to God. Mark 6, 46, Jesus dismissed the crowd and disciples and went alone up the mountain to pray. Church, he dismissed himself 
from the chaos that surrounded him. As much of a blessing family is, as much of a blessing friends are, sometimes we need to withdraw. And when I say we need to withdraw, I don't mean go out, do our own thing, go to a bar, go to a casino. That's not what I mean. To withdraw means to go to God. He dismissed the crowds and his disciples. He recognized it's time for some more time in the presence of God. It's time for some more time. In the presence of God, and you withdrew from chaos. Church, what chaos do you need to withdraw from? A time where you can just get alone with God. I love that Jesus went to a mountain. One of the most wonderful things we used to do in Bible college, our college had a good amount of property with trees. And then if you'd, if you'd walk by the, the outside basketball court, then there was another field there and there was a set of trees. And if you go behind there, there's, there's some picnic benches. And what people love to do is rise up early in the morning and go sit on those benches. And you just, you just absorb the beauty of creation as you spend time with the Father. Church, maybe you need to go to a mountain, to some woods, to a lake, and just get alone with God. The third means of grace is his body. This is really talking about fellowship, and I think we need this so much today. And it's overlooked often, and that's why we have to do this series about a quest for community. But church, we need, what we need is time spent together with other believers talking about Jesus. Time with one another, not just to socialize, not just to do activities, not just to eat, but to actually talk about Jesus. I was at my small groups on Friday. It was the last one before we relaunched them at the end of, the end of September. And we were just talking about this idea, the importance of fellowship and how, you know, we're able to access God's grace through other believers. And one of the things I shared was, was a thought that my professor in Bible college shared one class as we were talking about this. And he's an older guy. He's been walking with the Lord a long time, so he's passionate as he's sharing this. And he says, how come when believers gather together, they love to gossip? They love to talk about other people. Did you hear about so-and-so? Did you see what she posted? Did you see what he was wearing? And he says, when was the last time? He asked this question. This question has been stuck in my mind. He says, when was the last time you gossiped about Jesus? When was the last time you went to some other believer and said, man, did you hear about what Jesus did in so-and-so's life? Or let me tell you about what Jesus did in my life. Hey, why don't you tell me about what Jesus did in your life this week? When was the last time we gossiped about Jesus? I have an inner circle of brothers who I walk with. And one of the things that I love is whenever I'm discouraged, church, wherever, whenever I'm in need of more grace, I just call one of them up. And all I say is, man, tell me what Jesus did in your life this week. Man, what's God been doing in you? And so they tell me. 
And that just encourages my soul. It just builds me up. And what it causes me to do is pursue Christ even more. Church, do you have that? People you can go to and ask them, man, tell me what God did in your life this week. Tell me what God did. Mark 14. 32 to 42. It's really the story when God, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And one thing I find so cool is that he asks Peter and John to go with him. Jesus is in a moment of stress. He's in a moment of anxiety. He's really in a moment where he's unsettled. And so he goes to pray with the Father in the garden, but he brings James or John and Peter with him. And he says, watch and pray that you may not be tempted. For the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Church, Jesus understood that we need one another. That we find grace when we connect with one another. Jesus understood this. I'm going to conclude with some scripture. Second Peter 3, 17 to 18. Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your stability. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. He warns them. To not lose their stability or rhythm. And he encourages them to grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. Church, listen to this. Focusing on the wrong people and the wrong things will get you carried away. And it will keep you from growing in the grace of Christ. People are not your source. Church, things are not your source. I was having some issues with my phone battery, and so I called up their support team. I'm like, man, my battery's not even lasting half the day. What's going on? And she said, all right, sir, we'll figure this out, but we got to go through some troubleshooting. So she asked me, hey, is your phone updated? Is everything up to date? And I said, yes. And then she asked me, are you using the original charger that came with your phone. I'm like, what does that have to do with this? Our charger charges. Why do I have to use the original charger? And she said this. She said, if you're not using the original charger, or if, you were, if you're using a charger that wasn't meant for your phone, what it will do is give your phone a weak charge. So it'll go to 100%, but it won't last as long. She says, if you continue to use these chargers, it can even damage your battery for good. Church, we are intended. We were created to draw our strength, to draw our power, to draw our energy from God and God alone. So what sources are you plugged into? What people are you plugged into? What things are you plugged into that you shouldn't be plugged into? That give you this weak charge. You're good for a day or two and then you crash. And church, if you continue, you may end up like a damaged battery. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Where am I? 
looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Look to Jesus, consider him so that you do not grow weary or faint-hearted. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Church, we gotta look to Jesus. We got to consider him. That's why I took a moment there to ask you who's giving this invitation because once we understand the magnitude of who Jesus Christ is, we will not wait to go to him, to consider him. We will understand the promise of rest is certain. And we will be consistent in the habits of grace. Let me ask you a question. The life you're living right now, is it sustainable? The life you're living right now, is it sustainable? And if not, then how long are you planning to stay on that path? Consistency, church. Build into your life the habits of grace. We got to look to Jesus. Why? Because we become what we behold. I don't have this verse up there, but 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And so we look to him. Church, you can stand. I want to read this verse. And then we're going to just continue to worship God. Church, I don't know if you can relate to this verse, but I feel like you can. Because it's been resonating in my soul. I don't know if you're discouraged this morning, this afternoon. I don't know if you're weary, how weary you are. I don't know how anxious you are, how stressed you are. Some of you might be too discouraged to go to God. Look at what Hebrews says. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed church you ever feel like you got drooping hands like even when you're trying to spend time with the father you can't lift your hands you are weary and discouraged And when he says, come to me, your knees are too weak to walk into his presence. This morning, he is telling you to come to him. Why? So that what is lame, whatever is weak in you, whatever is discouraged in you, whatever is unsettled, may be healed. Come to me all all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Church, the King of Kings stands before us. The King of Kings stands before us and he bids you to come to him because he is supreme. He holds all things together. And so you can trust in his invitation and you can trust in his promise to give you rest so that you can walk according to the grace of God 
and live a life of rhythm. Church, I want to bless you as you leave. I'm going to ask the worship team to sing. And we're going to worship God. But if you've got to leave, bless you. I pray that you grow in grace and peace this morning. But let's pray, Father. God, we need you. God, I need you. God, we are so desperate for you. God, I thank you. I thank you for that invitation to come to you. All. And so, Father, I pray that our life, our hearts, our minds would be so captured by your majesty. Help us to grow in grace, God. To hear your voice. To know that we have your ear and your body. God, I pray that as we worship, whatever needs to fall off would fall off. Whatever needs to be added on would be added on. For your glory, God, and your praise alone, in Jesus' name, amen. Church, as the worship team leads you, you're dismissed. God bless you. Would you worship God in this place, church?